Thank you, Pat. Um, I became interested in creativity and innovation in my position at the University of Wisconsin, uh, where I had to create and compose uh, proposals for financial uh, financial support of my research programs. And of course, then I had to be innovative in the, in the uh, operation of the research. I also wanted to instill the idea of creativity and innovation to my students uh, because that would be important for furthering their careers. Now my talk is going to move along very much like this, uh, this depiction of the bull by Picasso. And uh, Picasso, uh, what he did is, as he progressed in his paintings and his uh, depictions, he uh, made his presentation more straightforward and, and simple, as I've shown here. And this is very much how my talk is going to go. It's going to become more straightforward and simple until I reach the point of pure bull. <laughs> Now, um, what I've demonstrated here uh, is, of course, that this is a joke and, and that's a form of creativity, but I've demonstrated two forms of creativity, two classifications. One is the idea of bending. And what Picasso did with his bull is he, he, he just bent the forms to create different, different presentations of the bull. And uh, that, that's called bending. Another type of classification for creativity and innovation is, is breaking. And the idea of a joke is a breaking, where you, you're following a, a, a line of thought, and then it's broken by the punchline, as in when I showed the, the pure bull depiction. So, uh, so let's move on, and uh, we'll talk about our definition for creativity. Now, there's, there's lots of books and so on, and I have a, a handout with a listing of all these books that I've utilized for uh, creativity and the definitions, and I've brought together many of these uh, de definitions and uh, many of the papers I've read to give this definition. And I'll be referring to these books and publications as I go along so you can refer to them if you find them of, of interest to you. So creativity is the process of producing something that is both original and worthwhile. Uh, there's two components. Uh, one is novelty, the degree of uniqueness or originality. And then there's relevance, the degree to which it solves a problem. And so uh, cre creativity is enhancing people's lives, enhancing your own life in the process. Uh, it's conceiving of something original or unusual. That's the thinking part. And then the uh, innovation part is the implementation, the actual doing. And this is the, the, the part where the entrepreneurship comes in and then the patents. Now patents, as, as we know, must be novel. But uh, probably those of you that do have a patent know that it can't be obvious to someone in your field. So th there is a lot of review on these, these uh, uh, publications and uh, legal documents. So what I've shown here is that the invention cycle, which was produced by uh, Professor Tina Selling at the Technology Venture Program in, in, uh, at uh, Stanford University, and uh, invention, of course, is creating something that's never made before, a product of unique insight. And she created this, this cycle, and I think this is a very valuable way of looking at creativity and innovation, the two processes. Uh, the first two steps are imagination and creativity. These, these are what we call uh, divergent thinking, coming up with lots of ideas. And then the second two phases, innovation and entrepreneurship, are what we call convergent thinking, bringing together the, the relevant ideas and those that you'll think will work and you work on. And this is the, the real hard work end of it, as we see in entrepreneurship, is to per persist and inspire. Now you notice that it's a cyclical form. Creativity breeds creativity. And we know this from the uh, development of the computer, all the new technology that's been developed since the the uh, revolution of the computer industry. And so businesses are very much in, uh, interested in this, this uh, concept of creativity. So we've had a really an explosion of, of technology in recent years, and a lot of it related, related to the computer, but after the, uh, the, a long period to the industrial revolution, the light bulb was produced, and 
then uh, was 90 years later that we had a moon landing, and you can see how it's decreasing times 22 years to the World Wide Web, and then just nine years to human genome sequence sequencing. And you can see why businesses are very much interested in this process because they're trying to keep ahead of this very uh, steep asymptotic curve of technology development. So uh, how my presentation is going to go, this is my outline. I've given you the definition of creativity already uh, based on a, a lot of other people's work. Uh, we'll look at, look at some forms of creativity. The uh, human brain or a little bit on the neural activity involved in the creative process. And then adages, statements expressing a general truth, such as necessity is the mother of invention. We've all heard that one. Classification of creativity, as I mentioned in my as I started in my introduction, we'll go through the breaking, blending, and uh, uh, breaking, blending, uh, a third one. And the mental locks to creativity uh, will be another category, and then uh, the characteristics of creative people, and then some ideas on how you can be creative. Okay, creativity uh, can be in, in several different forms. And I call them the little c, the things we do in our daily life, or solving problems in the workshop and so on. And the big c, uh, the, the Einsteins and the Feynmans and the Picassos that, that really affect the world and enhance our lives. Uh, the little c can be something as simple as you're doing a project and, and uh, you need to pound a nail in and you don't have a hammer and you grab a wrench and maybe pound it in. So there, there's lots of uh, little c's in our life and I believe we're all creative people. And it's just a matter of having a creative mindset. So uh, it's important to realize that it crosses all disciplines. Um, many people think of creativity as artistry or art, but uh, it, it's in the science and technology, which we'll emphasize today, uh, the arts, uh, business, as I've mentioned, education and psychology, and uh, architecture. So let's take a look at a few of these uh, different types of creativity. In a very simple way, uh, just uh, young people's um, hairstyles is a, is a creative process. And many uh, people like to look different. Uh, it's, uh, it, it makes us uh, excited to have a, a different look. Uh, in a more technological sense, we've seen a lot of creativity with the bicycle. I was surp quite surprised when I realized that the bicycle wasn't developed till about 1815. It had sort of forms, but not the, the human power. Kind of bicycle. So we have the recumbent bicycle, a stand-up bicycle, a uh, four-wheel bicycle, which is not really a bicycle, but uh, a lot of different creative forms, and, and it's continually being developed. And if you look on the internet, you'll see all forms of different bicycles. And then on the larger scale, stadiums are really becoming quite creative, and the architects developing this. Uh, shown on the left, upper left is the Bank One Stadium in Minneapolis. I've been in this one. It's quite gorgeous and open feeling. The Mercedes-Benz uh, Stadium in Atlanta, that uh, very, very dramatic uh, stadium in Hangzhou, China. And this futuristic stadium uh, in Guitar uh, being developed in 2022. Okay, why is it that we're always looking for another, another solution to a problem? We're never really satisfied with what we've done. It's always like we're looking for the next thing, and it's, it's a part of, our, part of our human spirit. Our, our brain is, is restless, and it's looking for change. And uh, the, the, one of the reasons is that we adapt uh, very quickly. Our brain adapts to uh, repetitive suppression. And uh, as shown uh, on the bottom right-hand side of the slide is, after a third reception, you can see the, the neural activity in the brain. However, after the 12th reception, it's decreasing considerably, and by the 24th repetition, we have pretty much lost that neural stimulation, which we're always looking for. So what, what is happening is that repetition imparts familiarity, and that's very valuable for predictability and for efficiency. We don't have to spend so much neural energy but also it breeds indifference. Uh, in, you know, in our brain, we're, as I mentioned, we we're striving for novelty and, and the surprise of creativity. So it's a very much a part of our human nature, and so we have to create a balancing act between the two. And 
and uh, between saving energy for a predictable world and the that intoxication of surprise. And it's a trade-off between the known and the unknown. And here's Nick Valenda going over Niagara Falls, and that's quite a balancing act. Now, I've shown the definition at the bottom of what are called skewer morphs. And these are uh, depictions, for example, a calendar on your uh, computer might show a binding which is useless, but it seems, makes us feel comfortable because it seems familiar. And the flipping of pages on a Kindle, for example, it's just a, a way of letting us adapt easier to these changes. And there is, always is resistance, resistance to change. So as I mentioned, we're going to look at a number of adages uh, related to creativity. This one, uh, genius is 1% <coughs> inspiration, 99% perspiration, uh, was stated by Thomas Edison, and many attributed success to this amount of perspiration he put in. But this is kind of a misnomer in a sense, because really you need the, ins the constant inspiration to, to put in the perspiration. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson said that you have to really already be doing the perspiration to get the inspiration. Uh, so uh, there's various interpretations, but this balance is probably more, more even than mostly perspiration. But Edison was known to, to sleep on his laboratory benches and so he could work long into the evening. Uh, and it also relates to this entrepreneurship, that last phase of the invention cycle where you're putting in a lot of energy to finally make a product of your imagination uh, exist. Uh, Edison had almost 1,100 patents, 11, you know, 1,100 patents, um, and uh, he held that record until '03 when a Japanese scientist overtook him. We know him for producing the phonograph, the incandescent light bulb, and the motion picture camera. Another adage is necessity is the mother of invention. And this was uh, stated by Plato in ancient Greece already uh, in his uh, publication, The Republic. And uh, you can see Edison's uh, necessity of having light for reading in the evening in your home or safety in the streets is very important. Uh, but a second one I want to talk about is the Apollo 13 dilemma. And those of us that were around during that period know that it was quite, quite a, a, a cause for concern for the lives of the three astronauts, Pace, Swigert, and Lovell. And what happened in the Apollo 13, and there's a movie about it, uh, and it's been recently on television or repeated. Uh, but uh, what happened, the oxygen tank exploded in the service module, the, mo the module on the right in the, in the slide, and uh, the, the astronauts had to move into the uh, lunar module on the left to save power for re-entry. So they, they were in quite a dilemma. And this was just one of a, a number of, of dilemmas they had to face. And so, but the lunar module was only designed for two people for a period of time not three people for 96 hours. So what was happening was the carbon dioxide from their exhalation was building up rapidly. And they had to figure out how to solve removing that carbon dioxide from the air. And uh, this was the problem. They, they had a square lithium hydroxide canister shown on the right. And lithium hydroxide was utilized to scrub the carbon dioxide out of the air. Lithium hydroxide reacts with carbon dioxide to form lithium carbonate water. But the, the, uh, the lunar module had circular or round uh, uh, canisters. So what you had to do was take that canister from the service module, fit the square module into a, a, a square peg into a round hole. That's basically, basically the problem they had. They didn't foresee that this would arise, this situation. I have a feeling they've changed this, uh, made them the same uh, dimensions now. But uh, what they worked with uh, Mission Control, and they realized what they had on board. They kind of did an inventory of what was available to really modify the square canister to fit into the round, round uh, reception, receptor hole. They had the cardboard cover of the Apollo 13 flight plan. They had duct tape plastic bags, some hoses from the suits, some socks, and a bungee cord. And so uh, the solution they came up with is demonstrated in this next slide. What they did is they, they took the cardboard uh, flight cover, wrapped it around the top of the canister, and covered that in a plastic bag, taped it with the duct tape, and attached the hose to one end so the air could pass into the square canister 
had a space where it could get into the uh, round tube and then into the round receptor tainer uh, on the uh, lunar module. And this was the solution. Very simple, but here we have a situation called, called a creativity in the box. Now we have, frequently we hear people talk about creativity out of the box. So Ringling College is always talking, thinking out of the box. But when you place with, when you place with a dilemma or a problem, thinking in the box can be as creative. So there's two approaches to creativity, and uh, we'll be seeing that as we go along. Okay, another adage is chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, this was uh, presented by Louis Pasteur in 1845 in one of his lectures. He, he stated this, and of course he's known for you know, our pasteurization of milk and immunization. Uh, but uh, what, what I'm referring to here is that these chance happenings or the serendipity or happy accidents happen frequently during a research project. And I know this as well as in my own research. And all the products I've shown up, up there uh, were a result of these of serendipity or happy accidents. And many Nobel Prize winners will admit that they had the, one of these chance happenings during their research, but usually only after they've uh, received the Nobel Prize. Uh, but this, this, uh, this, this chance happening only happens when they're working intensely on the subject, having knowledge of the subject, and uh, uh, they have the creativity and insight to realize the, the value of this, uh, this discovery. So let's look at a couple of these, uh, two of these, um, just to see how this happened. So I'm going to talk about here about Alexander Fleming, uh, the great uh, uh, scientist uh, from Scotland. Uh, he received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1945 for his discovery of antibiotics. What he was doing in his laboratory was studying the properties of the Staphylococcus bacteria. Staphylococcus occurs in boils in our nose and throat, and uh, I had a Staphylococcus staph infection when I was a student, and uh, they're very difficult to get rid of, and, and they can cause a lot of distress. At any rate, he was studying this, and what he, how he studied it was using agar plates, and these are plates where you have an agar, which is a polysaccharide, and you inoculate it with the bacteria and then you watch the growth, and you can see the different rates of growth uh, in that slide there in that agar plate. Now, most scientists, after they've studied for a while, will either throw out their plates or clean them up within a, a few days, a day, because they can fill up your lab pretty, pretty frequently. But um, Alexander Fleming was known not to throw away his samples, and he decided to go on vacation. So he lined up his some of the samples on the windowsill, opened the window for a little ventilation, and went off for 10 days. He came back from his 10 days of vacation, and he noticed that some of these inoculated uh, bacterial bacteria on, on the agar plates were inhibited. And uh, he was very intrigued by this, like something was inhibiting the growth of the staph. So he started exploring it with the microscopes and so on, and he found that what was inhibiting was the penicillium mold shown on the upper right. And this is, you know, the penicillium mold is not common, you know, it's not around uh, regularly. But he, he then determined that the laboratory just down below, one floor down, was studying uh, asthma reactions using penicillium mold. And, uh, uh, and what had happened was that they had their window open. Also, the, the spores from the penicillium mold had wafted up in his lab and inoculated his, his staph uh, agar plates and inhibited the growth. And so when he explored that, he realized that that was what was inhibiting the staph infection. So we're talking about major uh, serendipity here, really a happy accident, because not only did the spores come up into his lab, uh, but also the temperature and humidity conditions are slightly different for the growth of the staph and the penicillium mold. So uh, it, it was, it was a, a very uh, serendipitous uh, situation, and he admitted to this, but uh, of course because of his persistence and follow-up, he received the Nobel Prize, and that has changed our life dramatically in, in terms of controlling uh, diseases. Okay, one other I want to look at, uh, chance happening, is, is uh, the discovery of x-rays by William Rankin in, in the eight, eight, late 1800s. Uh, he was studying the glow in these uh, discharged troop, tubes, which, you know, cathode ray tubes, which contained electrons. And he noticed 
when he would turn on his tube, if there was a phosphorescent plate behind him, it would start glowing. And so he, he was a little surprised at this, so then he brought in a fluorescent screen, and it glowed. And when he turned off the, the ray tube, the, the glow would stop, and he realized that was what was causing it. And so then he asked his wife to put her uh, hand on a photographic plate, and he saw her uh, finger bone structure and her ring as well. I'm not sure why the ring was on that finger, but uh, that's where it, uh, it was situated. And he realized what was happening was that there was a different form of radiation in that tube. The electrons were striking the, the glass walls, uh, creating the glow, and in the process created x-rays. And that was how x-rays were di discovered, and he, he received the first uh, physics Nobel Prize in 1901. But he was aware enough to follow up. He tried to block these x-rays with books, and rubber sheets, and boards. And he realized it was a very penetrating form. And of course, we know x-rays are now commonly used in medicine. OK, another uh, adage, creativity results from a eureka moment. Uh, we all know the story of Archimedes, who uh, got in a tub of water, and noticed the displacement, and realized that it could be used to measure volume, and uh, ran naked through the streets shouting eureka. Well, I can't imagine many of our uh, scientists running through our streets, our main streets, shouting. Uh, shouting Eureka being naked, uh, but I think that might be the exaggeration part of this. But Eureka moments do occur, but usually they're at the end of a creative process. They're not like a passive where you sit around and hope that something's going to you know, come into your mind. It's pers persons that are studying the subject, have the insight and intuition, and are incubating on the, on the process. Uh, Professor William Wilson Morgan at the University of Chicago, who's studying the, the galaxies, uh, was walking one night and he happened to look up and he, he had, he called it actually a Eureka moment, but uh, uh, for the spiral structure of the Milky Way or the spiral arms and he proved this mathematically, but it wasn't like it just came out of nowhere. He had been studying the galaxies for, for many years, and he, but he had this moment where uh, he was able to see it during a walk and many of these types of Eureka moments come to people during a, a passive getting away from your subject matter. Okay, creative people are lone eccentric geniuses. Uh, we tend to think of creative people uh, as, as lone and eccentric, and there is some, some uh, credence to that a little bit. Uh, the, Nikola Tesla was referred to as the pigeon man of Manhattan because he loved pigeons, uh, which is not that unusual, but he had the horror of women's pearls. He could drink milk for days on end. This is only a uh, nutrition, um, uh, he had very long thumbs for, for, uh, for some reason, uh, and he would sign his manuscripts, and of course he came up with alternating current, uh, he would sign his man manuscripts GI, great inventor, so he was quite a confident fellow. Uh, this contrasts with the worm man from Devonshire, Oliver, Oliver, Oliver Heaviside in 1885, and he's uh, considered the forefather of modern uh, electrical circuit design. Uh, our, our terms impedance, conduction, conductance, and permeability related to electricity uh, uh, come from him. Um, but he would sign his manuscripts WORM. He had a very low self-opinion, which is not really typical of creative people. They usually have a good self-confidence. Now was Steve Jobs the lone, the lone solitary genius that came up with the revolutionary iPhone? Well, let's, let's take a look at that. Uh, there is a, a long evolution of the iPhone. As early as uh, the 80s, 1984, Bill Buxton at the University of Toronto was, was studying this touch sense, sensing of screens. And the, the pinch gesture on the digital screen came around in 1991. Uh, we had the Simon smartphone in 93, uh, Palm Digital Assistant in 99, so you can see this evolution. Uh, actually, in France, they came out with the lemur. Uh, in uh, 2005 as a, a touchscreen type of uh, uh, device. And Jeff Hahn at uh, NYU in, in Manhattan was, uh, uh, had come up, uh, was looking at just studying multi-touch screens. So what uh, Steve Jobs did is, is, is he put it all together in a very uh, usable device, the iPhone. And they utilized the capacitive touch screens and the sophisticated multi-touch user interfaces. So, even Steve Jobs admits to this, and I have a quote from him. He 
He says, creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something that seemed obvious after them, to them after a while. Many people just think creativity is just bringing together disparate uh, lines of thought. And, and uh, uh, we'll look at that a little more. But during his tenure, uh, all the products on the right, on top right were uh, produced during his time at uh, Apple. He wasn't a programmer, engineer, or designer. He just brought it all together. And uh, he, 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 uh, the, the Apple Computer Store became then a consumer products company under his, his tenure. OK, uh, I give you some of these adages. I like looking at those adages. They've been around a long time. And there, there's some obviously some validity, but some exaggeration involved as well with them. Now, one of the things that, when I was trying to put together a talk on creativity, I didn't have this classification scheme. And, and when this came out in a book very recently called Runaway Species by two professors from Stanford, Grant and Eagleman, I was really excited because there's a way to classify creativity through all disciplines. And uh, what they did is they classified it as bending, breaking, and blending. And I, I demonstrated uh, uh, bending and breaking in my introduction. But let's, let's look at this a little bit further, capturing the brain operations in a classification system. So let's look at bending. I already uh, sh showed the bending utilized Picasso and his bull, but Monet used it in, this, in the same sense here, uh, producing his uh, artistic uh, depictions of the beautiful Rouen Cathedral in France under different conditions of daylight. Uh, and you can see uh, that's how he that was his creative process. We also know this, uh, uh, this bending occurs with sculptures, uh, the human forms. We have Mayan, Japanese, and Ghanaian uh, across the top. And then with animals, in the case of horses, we have Chinese, Greek, and Cypriot. Now, of course, they're all human forms and animal forms, but the creative process has bent them in a different way uh, to create a, a pleasing effect. We all, one of our great vendors is the Frank Gehry, uh, who uh, has structures all over the world. I've shown some of them here. I've been in that University of Minnesota Art Center on the top right. It's a little confusing in there, but uh, it's a beautiful structure. The dancing houses in Prague, the Beekman Tower in Manhattan, and the Lou Rubo uh, Health Center is, is in Cleveland, and all by Frank Gehry as a vendor. And there is, uh, in terms of architecture, and he's quite famous for these uh, structures around the world. Uh, more technologically related, we have umbrellas. Innovative people are just constantly creating, as I mentioned, that there's, there's an excitement with creativity. Uh, you know, umbrellas in the, uh, ancient Egypt were just palm leaves, and the Aztec Indians used feathers. But here we have an aerodynamic umbrella on the top left, uh, then a collapsible umbrella, uh, hands-free umbrella on the bottom right, and then this uh, invertible uh, um, umbrella shown in the bottom left. And I, I, I appreciated this invention quite, quite, a bit, quite a bit. The other day when I was trying to get in my car in a, a rainstorm, I was trying to put my umbrella down and I was getting soaked in the process. And then I looked over and there was a young woman next to me and she had one of these invertible umbrellas and she just zipped it up and got it in her car without a drop hitting her. So these are on the market. Uh, they're definitely an innovation, and, and uh, it, it does enhance our life in a certain way. Okay, uh, further, furthering in the science area, uh, robotics. This uh, ant <coughs> robot developed by OrthoLab. It's made of fabric. It's lightweight, inexpensive, low energy because it's lightweight. It can be run on batteries. So it's, instead of using metals, we're using fabric for the same type of structures. We have the soft robotics in the terms of picking up, in the top right, picking up uh, living tissue or an egg, for example. And then on the bottom, the, uh, the, the caterpillar or worm uh, type uh, robotics that can go over rough terrain. OK, let's look at the other class. We looked at bending. Now we're going to look at breaking. And breaking, uh, I demonstrated initially with my showing of the uh, of Picasso's bull by creating a joke out of it, uh, breaking it with the punchline. But there's other forms of breaking too in art. Uh, shown on the left is actually the uh, Smithsonian, the, the 
Scottish Smithsonian Institute. They have these heads. Uh, and you can see other torsos, uh, I guess, in art. I, I don't know if we find it appealing to dismember the, uh, the human form, but uh, this apparently is so. Um, I particularly like this one. Uh, it creates a kind of a, a, a mystical effect of the uh, statue in Marseille, France, on the shores, where uh, uh, it's another form of a great team. Um, then we have uh, Johannes Bach. As a form of breaking. So we're, we've gone through some architecture uh, um, in terms of music. He created the, the uh, you can see the theme at the top of the notes, and, and, and this theme of the well tempered clavier, fugue in D major, he took the last four notes shown in red at the top, and then he just pulled that out, he broke the theme, and created another theme shown at the bottom where it that same four notes is repeated four times. But what I'm going to do is uh, just allow you to have a little listen to what, what Bach did with this. Um, what Bach did with this, he created what it created. Okay, back to my talk. Um, when you, this type of uh, approach is used in many montages from movies, for example. Um, when, when they bring, uh, introducing a movie, they'll use that rapid uh, repetition of, of notes, just as Bach did. And this was revolutionary at the time he did it. Uh, also, it, it, it just doesn't exist in ballads or folk songs or lullabies or that type of thing. So again, uh, this type of innovation uh, in another field in this case, uh, classify it as breaking. Okay, in terms of um, uh, more practical applications, uh, this is the, what's called the frangible mask. Uh, this was a light tower uh, in the San Francisco airport. Uh, one of the uh, airplanes was diverted, the 747, to a shorter uh, runway with a shorter, steeper climb, and it clipped uh, a, a light tower damaged the, the light tower as well as the cabin and the landing gear on the plane. So the FAA says you have to come up with a solution to this uh, light tower uh, so that we don't have this problem again. And what the engineers did, and it's quite innovative in creating this, they created this what's called frangible mass that would tip over when it was hit by a plane if that happened again. It wouldn't damage either of the, uh, either of the pieces of equipment. Quite innovative. Okay, this one I found particularly fascinating uh, in my research on uh, creativity and innovation. Uh, this is a film actress, Hedy Lamarr, from the 30s and 40s. I hadn't heard of her, certainly it was before my time. But, uh, and I was just shocked to see that a film actress was producing a patent, a very technical patent. And what she learned, the problem was, is that she noticed that radio-controlled radio torpedoes and submarines were being jammed by the enemy, in this case, the, the, the Nazi army. And uh, she said, I, I, can, I think I can solve that problem by, by hopping the frequencies or breaking the frequencies. So she uh, teamed up with a, a pianist, and they used a miniaturized player piano mechanism to make the frequencies jump around so that they, they couldn't be jammed for the submarine. And uh, she actually received a patent for this. And uh, she went to the Navy and said, you know, I have this. It was in the, in the early 40s, and you can use this. They said, well, we aren't accepting outside uh, innovations at this time. But before the Cuban Missile Crisis, they instituted her type of system to avoid this problem. So what this demonstrates to me is that anybody who concentrates on being innovative and, and has that creative propensity can, can make significant changes to our society. And uh, she, she was very excited about innovation. She even wanted to join the patent office. And I found this as an intriguing application. And here again, it's a breaking type application. Now, we, we all know 
cell phones are, are pretty prolific in our society, but uh, you know, there was a problem when they first came out. You just need one tower to transmit uh, signals for radio and television, and you can, you can serve the whole, uh, whole population in a city. However, when you get to the cell phone, it jams it immediately with all these people involved. So the Bell Labs came up with the system having individual cell towers that could use the same frequency uh, in, in, in different locations. So this, again, was a breaking concept. Uh, it worked quite well. Uh, and uh, it, it follows along very nicely with what Hedy Lamar did with her breaking frequencies there. I don't know if there was a direct correlation, but it's a, certainly the same concept. And I'll talk more about the Bell Lab because they had many innovations. Okay, the third category, we had bending, breaking, and now blending. Now, blending in terms of uh, sculpture, I've shown here the, the Greek minotaur, a man and bull combined, a, a lion and a man for the Egyptian sphinx, and a woman and a fish for the, the mermaid, the African mommy wata. So, uh, blending in the terms of, of sculpture. Uh, in, in terms of art, we have this example by uh, Jasper Johns. He created a, a piece of art by blending zero to nine, all the numbers. And uh, this was in the 60s, and he's still uh, still uh, producing art. And then more of a technological related uh, event was the development of alloys. Now these alloys were developed uh, thousands of years ago, um, and they must, obviously they must have been from serendipity because they, uh, they, they didn't have the technology to produce them, but they probably were working over fires and putting metals in and realizing when it had out of the fire and the ashes. But if you put zinc and copper together, you get uh, brass. If you blend copper and tin, you get bronze. So the brass is very malleable, moldable, whereas the, the, the uh, bronze, they're, they're much harder and stronger. So you have these, these, these brass knuckles and bronze balls. Now steel uh, is also uh, a, uh, an alloy, only it's doped with about two or three percent carbon. It's, uh, iron is doped with two or three, three percent carbon to make steel. Now that was discovered about 500 AD, but it didn't really come into use until the, the early 1800s. So you, you'll notice we have the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and so on. So these were significant developments. But these alloys are very important, innovative uh, types of products that have affected our society dramatically just the steel alone. Okay, I love this one, uh, this blending. This was done by Gutenberg in Germany. He combined all kinds of ideas to come up with this Gutenberg press. Now he realized the coin punch could produce an image on a small area. Uh, and then he realized that if I used a, 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 screw, a screw press, such as the wine press, I could, I could press an image over a, a, a bigger expanse. And so he was, actually Gutenberg was a, a, a goldsmith, so he had good knowledge of, of, of metallurgy, and he actually produced a special alloy with a typeset. It was a lead, tin, antimony typeset. And he, he, he produced these composing sticks, and thus, by, by putting it together in a system where you can imprint on a piece of paper, you can see that he produced pages, and pages became books. Uh, and this was revolutionary. This was in 1400. By 1500, there was, uh, the 1500s, there was 200 million books distributed throughout Europe. What happened? All of Europe became, all the regular people, the, middle class, they formed the middle class because they could start reading books. They weren't just for the, the royalty and the papacy. And it led to the democratization of, of, of Europe. Uh, but it also led to, the, uh, to nationalism because the books were written in the vernacular, meaning the language of the country. So it, it created some un, un, uh, unrealized effects. So it's, it's interesting that 500 years later, we have the World Wide Web. And you can see that some of the results are what we expected, but some are not. So uh, uh, it's a very analogous. This changed the world in a dramatic way, probably even more dramatic than the World Wide Web at the time. Again, because this Gutenberg put together these disparate ideas, they were all there, and put them together, uh, very much like Steve Jobs did with the, uh, the iPhone. Okay, some mental locks to creativity. 
Uh, this is from a book by Roger Von Volk, A Whack on the Side of the Head. I always like the title. Uh, he's given quite a number of them. I'm going to just go through a few of them here. Uh, be practical, follow rules, do errors wrong, play is frivolous, don't be foolish. That's not my area, and I'm not creative. So let's look at the first one. Uh, be practical. I'll be happy to give you uh, innovative thinking. What are the guidelines? That's a, a, a cartoon there. Uh, again, uh, you, you can't be too restrictive. I mean, you can't give a guideline for creativity. It, it's, uh, it either is a problem or you're, you're uh, having uh, working in an area and you get a creative way of variation. But uh, habit and convention are killers to creativity, being practical. It's the unfamiliar that, that's, that's important to creativity. And you know, most adults, 80% of the adults, find creative thinking you know, uncomfortable and even exhausting. Whereas the innovators say that they spend at least 40% of their time thinking about innovation. So it's, it's a mindset in a certain sense. We can all be creative. Uh, and Albert Einstein is known to say, I've never made one of my discoveries through the process of rational thinking. Uh, and he practiced these what-if experiments, uh, these thought experiments. As early as at 16 years old, he was, he was uh, thinking about running along with a beam of light, chasing a beam of light. But he realized if he caught the beam of light, it would be frozen in time, and then there would be no light. So, he, he then said, well, something else must change. It had to be time, so the time-space phenomenon. So as early as 16 years old, he was having these thought experiments, and we have the ability to imagine uh, these different types of scenarios, whether they're real or not, and Einstein's a great example of that, and we can do this as well. This relates to our soft and hard thinking, and that, uh, that cycle, uh, of our invention cycle, the soft being the divergent thinking, first two phases, imagination and creativity, uh, opening our minds to ideas, dream, ambiguity, fantasy, diffuse, punch, and metaphor. And then the second two phases, innovation and entrepreneurship, where the convergent thinking, as I mentioned, reason, consistency, reality, focus, analysis, logic, more, more relevance, the thinking and the producing. Okay, i continue on this, this first uh, mental block again, uh, follow the rules. Picasso uh, stated that I learned the rules like a pro so I can break them like an artist. Also, he stated every act of creation, creation is an act of destruction in a certain sense. And of course, we know him for coming out with cubism. And uh, he's one of the most famous artists in the world. We also know the Impressionists, Renoir, Monet, Pizarro, were all breaking the rules of art very realistic art, realism, and they became the Impressionists, and, and uh, they, they were not well received. And a lot of innovators, and, uh, there's a lot of skepticism that's a, sometimes a problem. The other, the other rule breakers are Beethoven, painting in symphonic form, Copernicus, who stated the Earth is the center, of the, or the uh, Sun is the center of the Earth, uh, the universe, not the Earth. Einstein, uh, gravity's ability to bend light. Okay, air is wrong. Uh, I've given a quote by Ken Robinson. Uh, Ken Robinson has one of the most viewed YouTube lectures in history. He's very entertaining, but he's uh, very knowledgeable. He's written a number of books and, uh, and as I mentioned, YouTube uh, presentations. And he said, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. And he's a big proponent of the education system. He feels our education system is emphasizing compliance and conformity and standardized testing too much. He says, we're, we're, we're educating students out of creativity. Students are most creative from the ages of three to 10 years old. They spend 20% of their time having creative thoughts. And he, he, he's a great proponent of having a greater diversity in our education system and uh, uh, more creative teachers, teaching teachers to be creative and less standardized testing. Now, every, practically every Nobel Prize winning uh, person in, in any field has said they had a teacher that really influenced them strongly. So the teaching aspect of this that can, can influence our creativity. Uh, Thomas Edison had a lot of failures. The error is wrong. He had a third of his patents rejected. rejected. And I found it interesting about Niels Bohr 
and Albert Einstein in, in, the, in the 1925 had a series of public lectures where they argued the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. And Einstein always said, you know, he came up with the concept of quantum mechanics, but he said, God does not play dice. In other words, the statistical or probabilistic nature. And Niels Bohr said, you know, it's the only explanation. And now uh, all, all physicists believe that it's the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics is the, is the valid theory. But again, here's Einstein actually being wrong in this sense, although he, he, he worked to the end of his life to disprove this. Okay, uh, just a, a couple of other types of failures, you would say, but not really uh, an error, but uh, these authors at the top uh, from uh, Stanford and Cornell, they submitted a paper on the superfluidity of helium that was rejected by the journal Physical Review, and they ended up winning the Nobel Prize on this subject area. And similarly, uh, the paper by uh, Peter Mansfield and, and Paul Lauterbauer was, was rejected by Nature, and uh, that was on, on magnetic resonance imaging. And uh, Lauterbauer was, said, you know, people were telling me I couldn't do it when I was actually doing it. He was very frustrated by this. And they ended up getting a Nobel Prize. So any of us in academia know that we have papers rejected. We have to work with the, the, uh, the reviewers to get the paper through. But in this case, they weren't able to. But uh, I think they had the final laugh as they looked as you can see them at the bottom. Okay, a third category of mental lock is play. That's just, it's, it's frivolous, don't be foolish. We always think, you know, our children should be you know, looking more uh, uh, seriously. If, if necessity is the mother of an invention, then we talk about play as the father of invention. Uh, Einstein described his work as combinatorial play. So play is important in, in, in coming up with creative thoughts. Uh, during what kinds of activities and situations do you get creative ideas? You know, is it from work, uh, somebody asking you a question when you're out uh, exercising or just relaxing? Well, they did a study of uh, several thousand people, and they asked them uh, this question, and it turned out to be two categories of responses to uh, creativity. There was either necessity, as the mother of invention, or play as the father of invention. And here's some of the responses, and I put them into each of the two categories. Uh, necessity when faced with a problem. When things break down and need to be fixed, this is, this is pretty obvious. Uh, there's a need to be filled. Uh, we're talking, when we talk about the Apollo 13, when they, they had a need to be filled. Uh, when a deadline is near, that's the ultimate inspiration, and we all know that. But then we compare that to play, when I'm just playing around, uh, when I'm doing an unrelated activity, when I'm toying with a problem uh, after my second beer, uh, you know, uh, just taking a walk can, can uh, incubate your, your creative uh, thinking process. So uh, we have several approaches to creativity. Okay, uh, coming up with these ideas, I, I've shown here a graph by St Stefan Mumau. Uh, St Stefan. Uh, gives a lot of workshops for businesses, and as, as I mentioned, businesses are very interested in creativity now to keep ahead of the, the, the game. And uh, he's done workshops, he has books, and he came up with this shape of ideation, this curve. And uh, what it's showing is the quantity of new ideas, uh, and, and the abscissa, or the ordinate, and the uh, time of the abscissa. And what, what he's showing is that initially when we receive a problem and we're trying to come up with ideas, we have an increase in our number of ideas. Or, or not necessarily truly creative, but we have ideas. And then we go through this period, this dip in the curve, and that's shown where most people stop. That's called the throne of agony. And it's at that point everybody becomes silent. They can't come up with any ideas. Then someone will say something ridiculous or stupid or foolish. And then all of a sudden people will start throwing in new ideas. And th th these are real creative ideas. Let's give an example, and this is one, from one of the workshops that Stephen Mumau gives, is that if you have a, a cereal box and you want to put a prize in it, when we were younger, I always was looking for that prize in the cereal box, didn't care about the cereal. Uh, but let's consider that they, they were going to have a Wild West theme. So you ask people in a group, what would you put in there for the little prize? And they say, oh, 
spurs, a saddle, maybe a pistol, uh, you know, a little horse, some of these things that are standard. And then they'll go through this throne of agony. Most people come up with those same ideas. They hit, hit it, and then it stops, and all of a sudden we'll say, oh, let's put a little bottle of whiskey in there, or a little bottle of antibiotics. And all of a sudden, the real creative ideas start coming out. So there is an idea educational curve. And where do you get these new ideas? From, from expanding your mental models. And how do we expand these mental models? How do we become more creative? Read widely, not only in your own area, but around, around all the other fields. Study the fundamentals of other fields. I know a professor at the Syracuse University, when I was a chemistry professor, said, you know, if you're doing a research project, don't just concentrate on your research. Read around what other people are doing, and it's you know not necessarily the same subject area. Expand your mental model. Uh, learn from people with widely different experiences. Uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg have a deliberate learning period each day, uh, which is important. Uh, becoming more creative. Uh, Richard Feynman, as shown down at the bottom, uh, was able to integrate primers under, under an integral side much better than the other students in his class. And the reason was he had read some books on integration that, the, that wasn't being taught in the class. And uh, of course, he was quite a, a, a brilliant fellow. But uh, just having other frames of reference and bringing them together is part of the creative process. Okay, that's not my area. It's another mental block. Uh, we, we, we use specialization in practically all fields, and it's uh, it's 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 efficient. Uh, it requires less neural energy, but it leads to this concept that that's not my area or that's beyond my pay scale. So uh, uh, that, that results in limiting your ideas in the sense of to a small area. You need to look into other fields to come up with these creative ideas. Uh, so this leads us to, to, to this question, and we could debate this for hours. Um, why didn't Western Union invent the telephone? Why didn't IBM invent the personal computer? Why didn't Kodak invent the digital camera? They all knew these things were on the, on the horizon. Uh, but it may have been this, this uh, very specialization in thinking in one direction. And finally, uh, a mental, uh, another mental lock is that I, I Self-confidence, I'm not creative. We, we are all creative. We have to think of ourselves as creative. Uh, the worst enemy to creativity is self-doubt, written by Sylvia Plath, a uh, novelist. And I love this quote from Marie Curie, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903. We must have perseverance and above all confidence in ourselves. We must believe that we are gifted for something and that this thing must be attained. Uh, and she, you know, she was a hard worker before she died from their experience with radiation. Uh, and motivation, most people say, I just don't have time to be creative. And I mentioned earlier that a lot of people find it exhausting. There is certainly an effort involved, and you'll find creative people have put in that effort. OK, there's a, so a few other factors that inhibit creativity, the, the sort of the group think, uh, the accountability or storekeeper approach. Uh, social constraints, cynicism can be a big problem. Uh, we Creative people tend to be a little more isolated, a little more eccentric, and sometimes they get more chastised. And so, uh, but you know, they have the confidence that they can, they can move on with their, their creative process. So this brings us, let's, we've talked a lot of, about the adages and uh, some of the locks. Let's look at some characteristics of creative people. I'm talking about the, 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 the big C creative people like the Einsteins and the Picasso's and the Feynman's. But uh, I've listed uh, six categories, and I'm going to go through each of these categories. But at the end, I'd like you to decide which one you think is the best predictor. And one of these is the best predictor of creativity. And uh, I asked my wife, I just showed her this list, and, and I said, well, just pick one. I didn't go through this talk, and she picked it out. I was, like, pretty impressed. <laughs> so let's see if you can find it. So we have passion, curiosity, daydreaming and solitude, insight, intuition, ideational fluency, lots of ideas, and personality. Passion, usually a strong family support, a family that, that supports the work that their, their 
child is doing. Usually the families have lots of books in the home. Uh, if it's a science oriented, they have a lot of scientific toys. I know my father was always promoting science because he, he always wanted me to get an erector set, which I don't think students have anymore, but uh, it, it, it is a creative process putting things together with the erector set. I've shown here Yo Yo Ma, who was playing three or four instruments by the age of four. Uh, and he performed for Presidents Kennedy and Eisenhower when he was seven or eight years old. Uh, strong family support, and he, he always attributed a lot of his success to this. Um, I found this statement by Paul Klee, the great abstract artist, very poignant. I create art in order not to cry. Now that's action. And then Richard Feynman, uh, that hero, I, I, he was quite a character, a very likable fellow. Uh, he's written a whole series of books, uh, the pleasure of finding things out. Uh, I, I love the one by him called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. And any of you would like to think that uh, scientists are stayed or physicists are stayed and that don't have a lot of personality, you should read his books. Uh, but he was heavily influenced by his father, uh, who asked him to challenge orthodox thinking. Now, in my childhood, I know what, we, what they wanted was compliance and conformity and, to, you know, to be a good boy. You know, they, my, my parents never asked me to, to challenge authority. So that's interesting, that, that support from his father that gave him that mindset. Uh, he also just uh, delighted in, in uh, had his own laboratory, delighted in repairing radios and created his own burglar alarm system. He was quite a brilliant fellow. But uh, his passion was so intense that, that uh, it, it does, did create some problems for him uh, in, in his later life. And I, I, I'll read this statement from the, the, the divorce decree from his second wife, Louise Bell. And it gives an idea of um, how passionate he was about his, his calculus. Uh, Louise stated, he begins, working in calculus, he begins working calculus in his head as soon as he awakens. He did calculus by driving his, in his car while sitting in the living room and while lying in bed at night. And that's in her divorce complaint. So uh, it, 